Morning everyone, uh, it's Tammy's 14th lesson. We just realised it was the beginning of December and it's now the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. So you've had loads of time to practice. Yay! Uh, yay. <laughs> uh, now with the new year, one of the things that I want to talk to Tammy about is direction and working out exactly what we should be doing for the next year of study and not just kind of ambling around. But the more focused that we can get, the better quality her lessons will be. Highly recommend it for any of you out there. The lessons is like an annual review and working out what you need to do and what you don't. Anyway, enough talking to you. Talking to you. Um, so things that you still feel like you want to work on, let's try and list them and figure out what we should do and make a plan to conquer them all. Yeah. Lovely new guitar, by the way. Yeah, thank you. You're super happy with it? Yeah, I am, yeah. Cool birthday present, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I still love my other one, but... Um... This one can actually be plugged in and you can hear it, so yeah, it's not improvement. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, yeah, so I think the, the theory side of stuff is still sinking in and, and you know, just repetition with that. When okay. I'm writing songs or learning something, trying to review the theory of it rather than just going back to my old style of... Okay, this. why why is the theory going to be important? For if I ever kind of had to work with a band or other musicians for recording and... Being okay. able to say what I'm actually doing and what key it's in. And... Okay, no, knowing the names of the chords is a pretty good thing. It depends on who you're working with a lot of the time, just to be clear, because I do think that learning theory and stuff is important, so I'm not trying to give you excuses not to, but like most times when I'm doing a record with a writer or a session or whatever, I don't even get a chart anymore. Like no one even tells me the chords. It's just expected that I can listen to it and hear what the chords are and then figure out what they are. Yeah. So in that sort of situation, if you're working with kind of professional musicians, they're probably going to be able to do that to some extent. So you don't have to be like most of the songwriters I know play stuff that they don't know what it is. Really? Yeah. Because I, I have been in situations before where I'd come into record even just on my own and the guy doing the mixing or producing would be like, okay, what key is it and what tempo is it? And I literally wouldn't have a clue. Well, having having an idea of the tempo is just as simple as getting like a like my metronome app or whatever, yeah. any metronome app that's got a tap tempo and then tapping along with the beat and it'll give you a number and then that's how many beats yeah. per minute it is. So that's yeah. something, and that, that's useful. You know, when we did recording, one of the things that we did right at the beginning was like figuring out the tempo and I got you to play it a little bit and I'm just trying to feel whether it should be a bit faster or slower yeah. because if you're going to record, you want to record to a click. Yeah. You don't have to record to a click. Like Led Zeppelin probably didn't for most of their recordings, but uh, for where you're at, it's really good because it means that you can do things over and over again and pick the best bits of each one, whereas if it's yeah. not to a click, you can't do that. So yeah. knowing yeah. the tempo is good. Knowing the key... Is helpful. Like, don't get me wrong. If I'm playing with somebody and we get, they go, oh, straight away, oh, we're, you know, we're playing in the key of G, but there's a secondary dominant on the six or whatever, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. It, it speeds things up a little yeah. bit, but yeah. I would hear it anyway, yeah, pretty quickly, yeah. you know, even if you knew on a basic level what the root notes were, yeah, and whether it was major or minor, yeah, that's kind of enough because any of the other stuff is extensions anyway, and people might or might not want to do it, yeah. The other thing that about theory that I think the, one of the reasons that you that it's a good idea to do it is that it can give you a springboard for doing lots of other stuff. So if you know what the chords are in a key, then it gives you somewhere that you know, like these chords are always going to work well together. If I'm stuck on, like I'm doing these chords, and I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure I want to try yeah. a different thing. Yeah. It gives you a pool of chords that are probably going to work. Yeah. But it also gives you some ideas like, no, I don't want to use any of the chords that are in the same key. I'm going to deliberately pick ones that aren't to I, see. I think that's what I felt has improved my confidence with doing more song, songwriting after what we've done. It's mm -hmm. just choosing a more more variety of chords and mm -hmm. like actually using bar chords or sounds and experimenting yeah. with them. So And just trying good. stuff that, even if it doesn't, you don't have to know the theory, you just have to know if it sounds nice. Yeah. That's the whole, that's the only rule at the end is that yeah. you have to like the sound of it yeah. and it can be as simple or as complicated or as weird or as straight as you like yeah it can be really easy chords that are all in the same key if the song's great it's going to work or it yeah. can be really wacky chords yeah. but i think it's worth you going back in delving back into the theory just course and just going through like i've got the whole structured course so you just have to go through it from in <laughs> order and and each time there'll be things to do it, it, it will push your boundaries on 
thinking about what's going on with the harmony. Stuff like later in the course when we start exploring chord grips and exactly how you change a chord from a major chord to a minor chord to a minor seven chord to a minor major seven chord to a major six chord or whatever, it will open your ears up to, to new sounds that you just wouldn't have thought of. Like this oh no, major six sound. It's a really cool kind of sounding chord, but you're never ever going to come across that chord just by yourself if you're just no. mucking around. You're not going to find that, no. you know, or you, you know. Uh, if you wanted to get all bossery one day, so, you know, <laughs> but it just, it's going to expand the horizons and the things that you might yeah. think of. So let's get theory back on the, on the routine and just say like, keep it going. We're going to do some theory. So wh what else is there? Because that's probably the least exciting of yeah, all of the things uh, so to So in terms of on. where I've noticed I still need to work on, it's definitely like my strumming patterns. I okay. go like by what feels natural, almost my strumming feels like a drum beat almost, but I think that if I was to try and write out when I was doing down ups, I I would be really confused about when I'm doing the down ups because I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. If that makes sense. Okay. So I think I quite easily go out of time. When it's okay. Not so so putting a, a down or an up in the wrong place if you stay in time is kind of okay. Okay. It's not ideal, and most people most of the time will be consistent with their down and ups because it's the easiest way to do it. It's yeah. not like some complicated thing that you have to do. Most, like nearly all of the great guitar players that did, wouldn't have studied or ever thought about it, do it the same way, which is the down strum on the down beat and yeah. an up strum on the off beat or in 16th note strumming, down strum on the beat and down strum on the and and up in between if you're doing 16 strums per bar. Yeah. There are exceptions. Ron Wood is my favourite exception, the guitar player from the Rolling Stones that's not Keith Richards, the other dude. Uh, he plays all over the place. Like, he's doing almost random down and ups. And I've watched him from this close playing and just gone, like, how are you making this sound so <laughs> wicked? You're completely doing it wrong. Yeah. He's Ron Wood. I mean, he's, you know, one of the greatest <laughs> yeah. guitar players ever. And, yeah. and he's all over the shop. So there's yeah. not, like... He feels great, though. And this is the, the, the most important thing is it comes down to this feeling of what you're doing in that if you're playing something that's really sweet and nice, you want to feel it sweet and nice. And if it's really angry and aggressive, you want to feel it that way. So the strumming should kind of reflect what's going on in the song. It's yeah. not like it's, it's less strict than that. Yeah. But saying that, playing out of time sucks, right? No matter who you are or what you're doing, if you're out of time, you're out of time and it needs to get worked on. Yeah. I literally, just in the middle of this conversation, I had this sixth sense that was like, something's not right. And I looked up and the, the Logic Audio, the computer program I used to record the audio, was had stopped. And I was like, oh, I've got to stop ages ago and I, we will have lost it. We're going to have to try and redo all it, which is redoing something that you've already done always feels like clunky and silly. But it was like right at the moment where I realised that's really freaky. Okay, um, so strumming. I just happen to have here three picks, which, because I'm doing my left-handed practice and strumming is one of the things I struggle with all the time, it makes a huge, huge difference, yep. the pick that you use. The really super thin one, it does sound a little bit clicky sometimes for recording, you get a lot of that yep. sound, but it's so forgiving, like you, you, you can be, you can strum a bit too hard or a bit too soft and it seems to even things out a little bit, yep. it's a bit like a compressor. Yep. The darker one, the grey one, so I can't read how thick it is. Four, no, 60. Well, is it 60 or 50? Can you read that? 60. 60. God, I hate that I have to wear glasses these days. Anyway, um, this one is less forgiving, mm -hmm. but sounds a little bit better. It's got, again, less, less yeah. click than the white one. The orange one is the one that is my preference most of the time when I'm playing normal way round. It's, it's got a lot less clickiness to it, and it's a lot more accurate. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the best thing. Yeah. It's better for me maybe when I'm playing single lines or doing like a solo on acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. But the more I'm getting into it, the more I'm more inclined to go thinner pick for mm -hmm. strumming. What are you using when you're strumming at home? Um, I was usually using one of the thinner ones. I don't know whether it was that thin or... Try, try the white one. Let's have a little play around. But just stay aware that the... the Pick thickness is something you want to stay 
thinking about all the time. And if you don't use the metal one that I've got for my no, birthday, no. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a cool ornament. Oh yeah, it's a cool ornament. Yeah, but I don't, I've never found them because they sound quite metallic as well. So yeah. they've got a. Yeah. I've, but again, look, Brian May from Queen played with a whatever half penny or something like a metal coin. Yeah, it's so, a big jump from me never using a pick to using a metal. Yes, <laughs> that's that's yeah, that's a bit of a jump. Um, okay, so can you just strum a tune for me? One. one if you can think of one where you sometimes feel like it goes weird, like a cover or whatever, and you know that there's a song that, like, oh, yeah, sometimes I screw up this song, well, do, then do, pick that. Should we do the one that I wrote where I feel like the strumming is a little yeah. bit off? Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Because <laughs> you got the squeakiest cap squeaky. over. It's because yeah. it's so old. It's like 10 years old. That's good. Did you feel like that went weird at all? No, but I still can't figure out what I'm doing if I try to write it down. Right, what, the strumming? Yeah. That would be a really difficult pattern to write down. That's why I can't write it. <laughs> yeah, why would you want to write it? I don't know, I'm just trying to like piece apart what I'm doing so that I know what I'm doing. Okay, so if you've got a pattern like that, it's 16th note strumming, okay? So there's 16 movements in the bar, okay? So like when you, just to recap in case you've forgotten some of this stuff, the first sort of strummings that you learn are eighth note strumming, where you have a down strum on the beat, so like one, two, three, four, and therefore one and two and three and four and. That's all of your options, and you could play all of them or just some of them, but the yeah. arm is moving down, down, down with the, with the count. One, two, three, four. You add the ups, one and two and three and four, and there's eight possibilities in the bar only. Okay. If you keep your hand consistent. If you decide to strum downs on the beat, the one, two, three, and the four, and on the ands, you strum down on both. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Yeah. You've now got eight down strums yeah. and eight up strums in between. Yeah? So yeah. one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. And that's a total of 16 strums in the bar. Okay. So when we're talking about strumming, we have eighth note strumming, where you've got eight possible options, assuming you keep your hand moving consistently, okay. uh, or sixteenth note strumming, where you've got sixteen different options. Yeah. That song that you just played was sixteenth note strumming. So I there's was sixteen. To write it into eight. I was trying to write sixteen into eight. <laughs> yeah. Well, would it, yeah, that would have already been difficult. Yeah. It becomes sixteenth note strumming when you understand how rhythms work and you can count them actually isn't very difficult at all because yeah. there are only so many groupings that you can have within the bar and you can still think of it instead of one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a, you can think one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and so it's just like two bars mm. instead of one yeah it's wrong to do it that way but it works and it's i spent quite a lot of time writing 16th note songs out as eighth notes because i didn't know how to write 16th notes out okay. and nobody died or anything so <laughs> you know it's all fine so but with a rhythm like that, I can't imagine why I would want to write it out unless I was writing a book and I needed to explain the song or I was doing a lesson and maybe I was going to slow the rhythm right down so I can get somebody going one E and a two E and a three. If I'm going to do that, then it helps me to write it out because I'm super clear about what it is that I'm doing. But for you, I, I don't see why you would want to write that out. I think I'm just trying to like understand more what I'm doing because mm -hmm. it's always just been fairly just instinctive stuff i guess I'm okay trying to so i and i i don't want to put you or people out there off learning things but playing instinctively is better than playing from your head yeah right just yeah. art has to come from there art is better coming from a feeling and just doing it than it is analyzing and trying to think about stuff it's just that's 
not where it should come from, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to get really into like super, you know, really complicated jazz things, then you have to do a lot of thinking beforehand yeah. and practicing. And but that's a different. It's just a whole different genre. Yeah. So it, it's not where you should come from. Okay. If you want to remember the pattern. For example, that would be where, where, like, sometimes I write down ideas, even complicated ones, because I'm worried about remembering it. But mm -hmm. I would always prefer to use my phone. To record it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> I used to just record audio, but now that phones have video as well, I've got this little funny tripod stand for my phone. I just stick it in there. It's got a microphone built onto it, so it sounds decent as well. And I record the video of myself playing it, so I can then hear it and see it. Yeah. Because I've got recordings of old riffs that I recorded where it's like, man, that's a wicked riff. I want to turn that into a song, but I can't r work out how on earth I've played it because <laughs> I've just got an audio of yeah. it and I can't, yeah. you know, I've done some clever thing like retuned the guitar or done something weird and I just can't figure out how mm. I did it. Mm. So... Recording yourself with a video is going to be a better option anyway. Learning about rhythm and how rhythm works and how to write it down is pretty valuable. Mm -hmm. Why would it be valuable? What's the value? If you're not going to use it to write stuff down, why would, what could it do for you? What was the thing about learning theory? What does theory give you? Just means you can figure out ways to broaden it or build on it. Okay, it gives you more options because you feel confident with where it is. So if you're doing 16th note practice and you've learned how to write and understand 16th note rhythms, yeah. suddenly you don't feel restricted by not having to do it or having to understand it or all of those rules are broken. Mm. You can just do what you like and you can go, well, okay, I'm going to do the first 16th note, the third 16th note and the seventh just to see what happens. Yeah. And you can just try it. Yeah. And it, it just suddenly expands the possibilities. Yeah, I think it just helps with your confidence as well. It's just knowing what it is, even if I couldn't write it out. Mm -hmm. So if someone went, oh, you're doing 16th notes, I'd, I'd have been like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> am I? Yeah. <laughs> am I? Okay. But now you can go like, yeah, I am. I don't really know which ones I'm doing, but I'm doing 16th note strumming and this is how it's working. Okay. You know. Cool. Yeah? Yeah. I... I think we should do some 16th note work, not today. What I want to set you for today is revision of 8th notes, and then we're going to look at 16th notes next time. Okay. So on the... I'm just trying to work, remember where it is on the website. I think it is in the theory course. I'll send you a link, uh, and I'll put the notes in the your lesson page on the website. Basically, all you need to do is on a piece of paper, write down one and two and three and four and. Yeah. Or type it into a computer, nice and big and print it out, whatever. Yeah. And then you circle some of the, the one and two Which and three and four and, and then you try playing it. Yeah. But you do, you generally, at this stage, I would put a circle on the one. You yeah. don't have to later on, but put a circle on the one for now. And then pick three or four other random ones and try them as strumming patterns, just, just remembering to keep your hand moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you did your song, then your hand didn't stop moving at all. It was absolutely spot on. Couldn't have been better. Because I, sh I mean, sometimes I struggle to flip back to that chord. But okay. I remember what you're saying about like, don't just stop while yeah, yeah, putting yeah. them down. Just keep, yeah, just keep, keep going. going. And if the chord time, doesn't so. make it, it doesn't make any. It really yeah. doesn't matter. Cool. Yeah. The one thing that you should be aware of, just so you don't freak out that it happens, is occasionally. If you're going, it's even 16th notes. If you've got one where it's going da, 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 sometimes it might look at the bottom like my hand's not moving. It is, it's kind of going, the, the movements become real small. So you don't always have to go like, because then it looks a bit awkward, doesn't it? Yeah. Compared to, I'm still making the movement, but it's just a lot smaller. It's exactly what you were doing. Okay. You would do. You would. Your hand kept moving, but there were a couple of times where it just went like that, where it was just such a small movement. Somebody might look at it, or you might look at it, like you video yourself and then watch it back and go, "Oh, I'm not moving my hand." Yeah. But the most important is again the feeling of it. That it doesn't just stop. Exactly. It'll feel. It should feel weird if you stop. If you're playing a rhythm and it stops, you should feel like, "Oh, I, something's gone wrong here. It's not working." Right. So that's a feeling thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay, I keep looking around now at the cameras to make sure everything's <laughs> still going, otherwise it's all going to go horribly wrong. Okay, so uh, can you think of another strumming 
song where you sometimes goes wrong? Because that one was fine and there was no problem um, with that one. No, I think maybe I'm just overthinking it a little bit. I think because when I put a beat to it, so I find it a lot easier if I get a drum beat up rather than mm -hmm. just using the metronome. With some of the changes, so that are just like slightly off time. So if you. And that I just slightly went out. There's a little glitch, yeah. Yeah. So glitches you need to work on removing, and that's just practice. the The, the idea of keeping the strumming hand moving all the time is the key yeah. to that. Yeah. That it's forcing that hand to catch up yeah. and go like, I'm not stopping strumming. <laughs> You've got to do it. You're going to make the change. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I know you didn't do my beginners course, but the, one of the things that I rave about all the time is this one minute changes. Like literally. Yeah. If you're struggling with a chord, and I still use it, if I'm struggling with a chord shape, I'll practice doing that one over and over for a minute and time myself. I mean, sometimes now I might do it for five minutes and then never do it again. So I'm not so much like writing my score down every day to do yeah. it. But like just then, for example, I just showed you this major seven, major six. And I said, oh, if you do a bossa, you might start using that. And I'm like, oh, wow, I haven't done that chord change for so long that my fingers felt really slow to get there. Yeah. And this is an awesome chord change because all of the fingers have to come off and swap places. Yeah. It's really difficult. And I was like, okay, this is one I already banked in my little memory. When I practice this afternoon, I'm going to do some practice on this chord change because it's a great exercise to get my fingers... Ah, see, they're not always going exactly in the right spot. It's doing that thing that you said about almost trying to get them in line in the air. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Down. So there, it's already the shape is roughly there. Yeah. But it is, it's just the repetition. That's what will get that there, is doing... Yeah. Wait, this is, that, I haven't done these sort of changes for so long that my forearm is already feeling like, <laughs> what are you doing, man? Wow. I need to do more practice. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the answer is doing finding a chord change, uh, making sure that your hand doesn't stop moving. Yeah, trying to note what the mistake is if there's a chord that's a problem, and then pulling that little bit out, and then doing that over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah? yeah. if you're struggling to find the problem, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but uh, the best way to figure out a problem if you know there's a problem but you can't tell what it is, is to try to make the mistake. And treat yourself as an un, as a uh, an observer of yourself. To, so, like, kind of almost stepping out of it and going, I'm going to try and make the mistake, so that I can watch what the mistake is mm. and see the mistake, because then I've got a chance of fixing it. So, if you find that there's a mistake happening consistently in a song and you can't figure it out, try that. Just it's just a shift in the mindset where you just go, okay, I'm going to make the mistake now. And I'm going to watch what it is. Yeah. And then either the mistake goes away. Which is really interesting that when you try to watch for it, it's like your brain goes, oh, I'm not going to let her see me doing this. So <laughs> it just fixes itself. Yeah, yeah. Or you get a close look at what it is that's gone wrong and then you've got a better chance of fixing it. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, your strumming looks really good. For somebody who didn't strum really at all with a pick when we met, it's amazing. You're doing proper, that strumming pattern that you're using in that song is as complicated as you might want strumming to get in a normal pop tune, yeah. you know. It's feeling a lot better with the pick. It feels a it lot more normal. It looks now. loose and natural, and it looks easy. It looked comfortable and easy, and that's the best thing it can be. We can make it harder, and we can do stuff like this. You know, deliberately trying to push the what you are capable of yeah. by making the sixteenth patterns more complicated and using this thing called syncopation, where we accent some of the beats that are not the ones that you would commonly accent, which just throws the feel mm. like that. Uh, 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 Vance, Vance, it, Joy. Vance Joy song that you played which was in four but it doesn't feel like it because the accents yeah. are not where you would normally find them yeah. so if you count it it's in four but it didn't feel like that it felt like three 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 and two or some sort of like oh hang on what's going on here <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. so you can deliberately try and explore that kind of thing I don't know whether he is a you know a, a theory buff and deliberately explored that as a thing, or whether he just stumbled upon it. Either one of those things. Does that possible, come with but... the kind of percussive element as well? Kind of with the when you're accentuating like one area, it almost becomes like a little bit percussive in a sense. Like it creates a bit of a beat. Yeah, I mean it, the percussive thing is normally 
used to describe like specifically doing like a yes. this kind of doing a that would be or doing you know getting all my doors on it where you're tapping on the body of the guitar which I'm terrible at so I'm not going to try and yeah. demo that kind of thing but uh I can probably show you some more of those the techniques that I'm familiar with and I can probably show you some of the ones that I suck at because I just haven't practiced them I think I know how to do them so <laughs> you can practice it and get good at it um not going to put my guitar flat and start doing no 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 we're not going to do yeah that's I mean it it's sounds cool, amazing though. but yeah yeah I um, can't do that um so strumming let's put it back on the practice yeah. routine as being like a five minute practice session on trying to expand your strumming horizons right because i don't think you've got a problem with it but it could definitely be expanded on so having a look at your doing the um if this you know your next between our next lesson we look at eighth notes as a revision thing yeah. and just really try and push it out and find some fun strumming patterns yeah. that you could apply to a tune okay yeah? cool so that's yeah. for strumming okay next on the agenda for things that you need to work on finger style finger style okay yeah. so stylistically for you as an artist as a songwriter you want to have both strumming and finger style as part of the repertoire yeah. a lot of guys tend to or guys and girls tend to have one or the other yeah but you like both yeah okay Definitely. so we talked a little bit about this uh the other day and the the finger style that i'd shown you so far is kind of a folk finger style thing where the thumb stays pretty consistent mm -hmm. and i think that's a really cool thing to learn it could be it, it it doesn't it's not super restrictive like you can use it in lots of different styles i think i gave you a chili peppers example in the last lesson as, yeah. as you know there's lots of ways around using this idea of a consistent thumb pattern but it doesn't have to be that way mm -hmm. and there's plenty of stuff along the lines of like James Taylor or uh, Don McLean. They're, they're both folky as well, but definitely it applies to more modern people. I'm just trying to think of, who, well, Vance Joy, the, that one that we said, yeah. where the pattern is not so rigid and it can just kind of morph a little bit with the chords. A lot of contemporary stuff as well is a, a lot sparser than that and it doesn't even have to be like this continuous flow of finger style patterns so a lot of the yeah. you know john mayer or whatever is is much more empty yeah. and it, it's still finger style because you're using your fingers but it's not even a pattern you, you get a lot more of this sort of like it's finger style but it's not like <laughs> It's it's completely different sort of finger style to that. Yeah. So. Uh, That's why I think I picked that Vance Joy one because when I listen to it, I'm like, oh, okay, cause he, he's not hitting like a a downbeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Single. It's like you say, it sounds really sparse. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I said to you, what style is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that the part of the because it's such a big area. Right, so it, it, when you start on guitar, or you start on anything, you only see like the basic bit. So you go like, oh, I want to do with a pick or with you do finger style. We go, okay, well, let's have a look at this. But you're at that point now where there's where there's finger style, mm. but now there's so many different bits to finger style. Mm. It's going to be really helpful to kind of refine what the things are that you really love, and it doesn't have to be uh, restrictive. Like, oh, I'm only going to do this one now. It's just like. Which one do I want to look at for a little while and explore and incorporate into my own? I tend to refer to it as a soup just because it's a, an analogy that kind of works. Is that like what are we putting into that? Like what what things in my soup? What flavors do I want to add to it? Because it doesn't have to be like oh I want to do some country, so I'm suddenly going to empty out everything I've learnt before yeah. and try and make a new country soup. No, yeah. I just go well. I want a bit of that country flavor into my collection of flavors that i like yeah yeah so i think one of the things would be like super helpful uh i think we're going to do it offline like because i'll get in trouble with copyright police if i start doing um if i start playing tracks in in the lesson but we want to sit down and go through maybe f three or four tunes and go well these are the songs yeah what is it about them that i really like and what style of finger style is it? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, now, and actually, I've just kind of half changed my mind. We're going to listen to the songs now, but we're just going to have to pause it. 
So uh, Adam, who will be editing this video, you're going to have to cut out these things. I'm going to listen to some stuff on Spotify when Tammy tells me what it is. If you're watching this on, on YouTube and you want to kind of understand what it is that we're talking about afterwards, you could just look up on YouTube or Spotify the names of these songs and uh, come back and I'm just going to listen to like 30 seconds of them or something and then we'll talk about it. So you might want to check that out. So what are we listening to first? Outnumbered by Dermot Kennedy. Outnumbered by Dermot Kennedy. Okay, so we've just had a little listen to Outnumbered by Dermot Kennedy. Now, this has got that same sort of thing that was going on with the Vance Joy thing, which is really interesting, in that the pattern, and I'm not going to try and play exactly that pattern, even if I could, uh, it's got this interesting thing where it's still in four, yeah. but it's dividing it into three groups of three and two groups of two. So it was going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One two one two yeah. One two three one two three one two three one two three one two one two one two three one two three one two three one two three one two one two. Yeah. Right. So it's still one and two and three and four and 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 six eighth notes. I just counted it as eighth notes just to keep it clear what was going on. But you could hear it was still one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. But the pattern was one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it, I mean, it's a really nice little. And I'm just using to keep it simple. I'm using thumb one, two, thumb one, two, thumb one. Two thumb one, two thumb one, thumb one. I'm just using G, E minor, C. And it is literally that uh, two lots of eight, so 16 yeah. picks has through. been divided into four groups of three and then two groups of two yeah. to get to our 16. Yeah. Yeah? That one is very pattern-based. Mm -hmm. And that one, that song, as far as we got listening to it, I didn't listen to the whole song, but that is about finding a little pattern or quirk. That's the kind of thing where possibly they didn't know. They just played it. It sounds chopped to me. My first instinct when I was listening to it is a producer's heard. It might have originally just been... And the producer's gone, oh, let's just take the first four of those and then chop the next two smaller and stick it together. And not, of course, I mean, I've listened on my iPhone, not even in the yeah, yeah, yeah. studio monitor, so I might be completely wrong. But that was my gut instinct listening to it. But you could make up any, so within your bar of 16 available notes, or two bars of eight notes, depending on what way you want to look at it, you can make up any sequence or pattern of those that you like in any order you don't have to it doesn't yeah. have to be one and two and three and four and with the accent on one and two and three and four and it can, yeah. it can be all over the place yeah. it's interesting to me that you've picked the other song the vance joy one that you played me was almost exactly the same thing which was groups of three and then a group of two I at think the end there's a ben howard one that i think is it might not be exactly the same but i think it is like yeah it sounds like it's not so that's not like it this idea of putting threes against, they call it three against two, but groups of three and pulses of four, if that makes sense, isn't an uncommon thing in fingerstyle. That's one place where writing out an, a riff can be interesting to do in tab. Yeah. Just to, you don't have to worry about reading music, you don't have to understand the analysis, mm. but especially if the rhythm of it is consistent, writing it down and just figuring out what the count is can be helpful. Yeah. Especially in something like that, like I can do it in my head, I'm listening to it and it, you, you might have, you, know, you wouldn't have because we edit that bit out, but I was definitely count, as I'm listening, first of all I'm listening going, is it obvious what it is? No. 
Okay, is it a, in an odd time is my next question because it felt like it has a glitch, that song particularly at the beginning. It feels like... <laughs> Glitching. Yeah, yeah. So then it was like, okay, is it in an odd time? Because songs don't have to be in four. Yeah. Like we're just talking at the moment about things being in four, but songs can be in seven or five or six, eight, and there's mm -hmm. lots of different... Like six, eight is very common. So having this one, two, three, four, five, six feel like a... We have this one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So why wouldn't you count that two, three, four, one, You could. Two, three, four. But you how could. do you know that that's not... You, well, to, in some cases you don't, So, and it doesn't really matter, to be honest. The thing that's important with the, the reason we talk about a 6-8 or in what you're talking about would have been 12-8 is that the feeling is in threes. Oh, okay. It feels like... Da, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah. Because when you have an eight at the bottom of a time signature, you tend to have these feelings of threes. Not always... and. An, 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 I don't want theory pedants coming down and having a go at me on that. But as a general thing, 6-8 or 12-8 yeah. or 9-8 have these feelings of three. So 6-8 where I'm saying 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You could think of it as 1 triplet, 2 triplet, 3 triplet, 4 triplet, 1 triplet, 2 triplet, 3 triplet, 4 triplet. But you tend to, if it's consistently subdivisions of three yeah. you tend to call it either six eight or twelve eight so it's the feeling of it okay it is just to do with the whether the beat is divided into threes or twos okay yeah so that's where we're getting that little clash where i said to the that that other song we were looking at was one two three one two three one two three one two three one two one two one two three one two three the first part of it you start to get this feeling that it's da 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 it's like oh hang on what it went weird so in that case you have to be feeling the eighth notes yeah that it's one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two Yes. You have to be feeling that right from the beginning because if you yeah. feel like one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, one and two and one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, one and two and one, it's just like, oh, yeah. it just it, the feeling of it is gone. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's a very, it, it is a, a slightly sticky situation. And there are times where I feel like, I'm listening to a song, I'm like, well, hang on, am I going to call that three, four, like one and two and three and one and two and three and feeling? Or is it one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two? I'm like, oh, which it could be. Yeah. Some songs live in both camps. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Um, let's, let's pick another one. What's another one on your list? Mm, should we go slightly, something slightly different, do a bit country? Okay. Um, Burning House by Cam. Burning House by Cam. Okay, let's pause this now, Ad. Sorry, I'm having trouble <laughs> operating my phone. Um, so this song, Burning House by Cam, this is a really, like a fairly complicated finger style riff. Yeah. Um, da, 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 one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a, it's the subdivisions. Okay. But this is really a um, this is a constructed piece where those things have been organised and I would suspect built on. Uh, like she might have just made it, the whole thing up. My feeling is that it's probably been like she had a starting point or a riff and then she's grown it and tried to figure out very much like piecing the little bits together or whoever's doing the guitar. I, I find you know. it interesting because I feel like in that song... It's what they're picking on the guitar is almost like exactly what she's singing at the same time. Yep. Like it's exactly the same pattern that like her song and what the guitar is Yeah, doing. yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people try to find those links where it is a really nice thing to find elements of the guitar that are either playing the melody or that are harmonising with the melody. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can breed from each other. So the part that you come across for the guitar might influence the melody line or the melody line might influence yeah. the um, the guitar part. 
and I think that's a good thing. There's mm -hmm. like I don't know. Uh, obviously, we're not going to start playing all of the tunes. I don't know Blackbird by the Beatles. Where you? The, yeah. So I just tried to give this example of Blackbird by the Beatles, and the melody is nothing like what's going on with the guitar part at all. Like it's the opposite. The melody notes are not even slightly like what's being played on the guitar. In such an amazing way, I'm just like, oh my god, the you know, of course. McCartney was a genius, but it's like now I've got even more respect for a tune that I already loved. Anyway, the only ones I can think of right now are things like the Vincent by uh, Don McLean, you know, Starry Starry Night. Oh, yeah. that one, you know, that's a uh, Starry Starry Night. Think you found a blue so there's like influences. So is it likely that they wrote that guitar part and then he just sang? What? Who knows? It could have been he. He possibly went. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to sing this melody. <laughs> or maybe he was going starry, starry night. Or maybe I'm going to play it on guitar. You know, it, who knows which way around it came? Maybe he doesn't even remember. I don't, I don't know. But that's for sure. They influence each other. The part that you play. In fact, it kind of should. So when, as you, and I think it should be kind of, it should follow the process mm -hmm. together, like the way that you find a melody and the way that you find those things. Like, definitely for me, as writing with Weekass, a lot of the stuff is, it's just a seed. Yeah. That's all I'm looking for. You know, and it could be, uh, and we've got this one song, The Wrong Place to Start, which starts with this chord. <laughs> The whole idea for me, the, the the point of it was trying to find some interesting chords further up the neck that used open strings as well. Yeah. So, and I found that chord. And I was like, okay, what else can I do with this? So then that, that was the seed. Sitting there, the singer's like, Oh, I've got this idea for oh, yeah, mm -hmm. waiting for hours to smoke this cigarette. And it, but it, and that's not necessarily related to it, but it, it was born more or less at the same time. And then she started to lead the part after here, and definitely that the, the, the melody line for the song is wrong place to start, wrong place to start. Yeah. And then she's like, uh, and I can't feel these tears no more. Yeah. Uh, we can be anywhere. Da, 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 da. We can be anywhere. So it started to then, after, even though the initial idea was my finger picking part, yeah. she then found a melody, but then she took the melody, found, found a strong way for the melody to go, and then that was dictated. She's like, the melody is this. So I then had to find the guitar part. So that's yeah. part of that. Bounces back and forth. And it can bounce back within yourself if you're writing a song on your own. Yeah. Or it can, and so it can be the melody that you feel leads it or the chords can be that lead it or the, yeah. the riff could lead it. Or do you know what I mean? They yeah. can all merge together and there's not really one way to do it. Every songwriter I meet finds a different path or a way to do stuff. And I don't think it has to be one or the other. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So that particular example could be where you find, like the, the song that you played with the wacky chords that you don't know what they are. Yeah. That kind of stuff can lead the way a little bit. Like you might find another way of approaching that with finger style. Like if you tried to play it finger style, you might find that it would change the melody or you yeah. might have other ideas for the melodic content. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It doesn't have to be one way or the other. As far as the fingers, the study of that, to learn to do that, the only approaches are learning songs that you like, like learning that song, transcribing it and learning how to play it. The advantage of that being that it would force you to learn some new patterns and some new ideas mm -hmm. and some new chord grips and all that sort of stuff would yeah. be a very beneficial thing to do. Sounds quite hard. That sounds, sounds really like hard. it'd be like a, a, a full morning project for me to transcribe it. So that'd yeah. probably be a few days study for you to, to do but a good you'd learn a lot in the process yeah. but mostly I think those things tend to be about you exploring your limit to find out what you can do mm. 
and then but trying to actually construct something yeah. yourself rather than just going like I'm going to fall into a pattern that I know the Dermot Kennedy one I watched him when I went to see him live and I was like oh I can see like if he uses a cafe or something and it, mm -hmm. uh, no like he literally was going like all the way up and down and I was like I'll have to attempt to learn that the hard way yeah. at some point well be give it a go Wait, is that the outnumbered one the first, the first one. one I don't think that was actually going to be too difficult to do no it's just more that he moved a lot around yeah so let's talk about that in uh, one second. So I want to give you another task. So we already set the task for strumming, which is your eighth notes, exploring and yeah. deliberately trying to push the boundaries. Yeah. I want you to try to write a finger style guitar riff mm -hmm. that is something that you find complicated, but you think is going to be achievable. Okay. So just explore. I don't want to give you any more limits than that, but I just want you to try making up a riff, explore writing an acoustic guitar riff mm -hmm. and see if you can make something up that is challenging yeah. but achievable. So not something where you go like, oh, I've got to jump from here to here in yeah. a nanosecond is just like not going to happen. Yeah. But something that's enough to make you go like, oh, yeah, this is a bit awkward for me, but I like the sound. Only something you like the sound of it. Yeah. It's not like I want you to make up some complicated crap that doesn't sound good or that you don't like because yeah. that's just, there's I don't really see too much point in doing that. But trying to find something that you like that's cool, interesting, and a little bit maybe more complicated mm -hmm. than you might normally okay. attempt. Yeah? Yeah. On transcribing, we've talked a bit about it before, but let's take that Dermot song as an example. Mm -hmm. I want you to work out how he did it. Okay. And I don't want you to use YouTube videos. I don't want you to watch it, and I don't want you to use tabs from anywhere at all. Mm -hmm. No googling it or mm -hmm. any stuff like that i just want you to use your ears and try and figure it out okay. now we already said that pattern i've already given you the big clue which was it was three groups of uh, four groups of three and then two groups of two mm -hmm. the trick to it is always to use that slow down software to slow it down to a manageable speed mm -hmm. and then just working out a note at a time yeah, just so the just clue. the first time you're just trying to work out what the first note is yeah. so just listen to the first note that's the beauty with that transcribe software is that you just use your space bar on the computer. You press space bar, you hear the first note. As soon as that first note's finished, you hit the space bar again. So the sound stops. The last thing you hear stays in your ear. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. So then you've got that one note in there and then you're going to go. Oh, I still haven't got it. Do, do, stop. Do, do. Oh, yeah, I've got it. There yeah. it is, the first note. And then you write it down on a piece of paper. You don't have to write it down, yeah. but writing it down just speeds it all up. Otherwise, you have to try and remember every step. When you've got like 40 notes in, you'll be wishing you wrote it down. So yeah. write it down. Once you've got the first note, then you listen back again to two notes. So it goes, do did. Mm -hmm. Stop it. So play, do did, stop. Do did, do do did. Oh, where is it? Do do do. Or whatever. And you just fumble around till you find the right one. Makes sense. Yeah? Have a go. Cool. That one I don't think is going to be too difficult because I think it's going to be moving around a shape that moves around. Yeah. So once you find the shape or shapes, yeah. you it, it won't be difficult. As an exercise, it's really good to do that. Mm -hmm. you know. And the more... The way it works for me is that I'm always looking for new things that I like or new ideas. So when I'm listening to music, I try to do this like mindful meditation but I use music so rather than it just being like meditating thinking about breathing I put music on and I try and really get inside the music mm -hmm. and I find it just as relaxing the problem part for me with doing that is that I have to have a pen and paper out because if I hear things in it that are like I have to work out what that is it's genius and I just kind of come out of my little meditative thing and I write down the song and the time yeah. or sometimes just the time I remember the song like one minute 13, and I know that I can go back to it later and then try and work out just that little bit. Yeah. So sometimes I work out whole songs, but usually these days I just work out little bits that I like because I'm too busy to do whole songs unless I'm teaching them. Yeah, so makes sense. try and keep an ear out for stuff. If you're in the car and you hear a little bit of something that you really like, like, wow, that, that little bit of that was amazing, mm. just make a note of it and then go home and try and work out what it is. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh... Does that kind of give you some direction for fingerstyle? Definitely. Yeah? So yeah. that's your, your exercise. But we're going to probably explore... Um, we should do, try and do a little bit of this every week of just listening to songs that you like, and I'll give you a bit of food on how they're 
might be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, just to keep you on track, because I'm, I'm really, one of the things I worry about as a teacher is giving you too much of my influence and going, I think you should learn these folk figure style patterns because that's the sort of stuff I like. Yeah. Uh, that might not be, it shouldn't be necessarily what you like. Yeah. You know, hopefully some points I might be able to introduce you to music that you really love and you go, wow, I never would have heard that before if, I, if you know, if I hadn't been introduced. The same probably you for me. Mm -hmm. Advanced Joy, I hadn't heard before. I'm like, wow, I should have listened to this guy. Cool. You know, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Um, okay. We talked very quickly before the lesson about roughly the things. We've covered fingerstyle, we've covered strum, we've covered analysis in the theory side. We haven't talked about you. You mentioned with your song that you didn't know what the chords were called and all of that. And I said to you, you don't really need to know. Yeah. But I would like you to do a little bit more. Yeah. Theory study. Cool. And the last thing which I added on there that you hadn't mentioned that I'm fairly sure is something that we should work on or you should work on is recording. And, and getting hipper with logic and and not using my phone. <laughs> yeah, not using. Well, no, you can use your phone if you like. But I I, I feel like there's a lot of benefit yeah, to be had no, by getting a grounding in how that stuff works, how logic works. Yeah. And so one of the things you got it on a laptop, right? Yeah. And you've got logic. Yeah. So I would like to give you a project between each lesson of recording a particular thing and trying to do a specific thing that we can then discuss a bit in the lesson. If you bring your laptop with you, we can just either plug it into the studio or we can just listen to it, you know, okay. from laptop. Okay. Um, and I would like you to record a song, an acoustic guitar riff or a, an, an idea, and I'd like you to put drums to it. Yeah. And I'd like you to think about what's going on with the drums. That's actually, actually it. build the drum myself. Either build the drums yourself or use the built-in uh, Logic drummer, the Kyle or whatever their names yeah, are. Yeah. Um, if you're going to use the the Kyle thing, I'm going to call it the Kyle thing because it's the only name of the one I can remember. I can't remember what they call it. Yeah. Drummers, built-in drummers, auto drummers, something. I'm sure it's got a fancy name. Um, if we do use those, we'll start to talk a little bit more next time about like whether you should be using the sparse one or the busy one and what that means. If you can, it would be cool to have a go at building mm. a most basic drum pattern. In fact, it would be a good project for you to do it anyway, actually. So I'm going to give you the task of building a straight eight drum pattern. Yeah. A straight eight drum pattern has the kick drum, mm -hmm. which is the big low sounding one on beat one and three. On two and four, it has the snare drum, which is the very loud clacky one. Mm -hmm. And on one and two and three and four and, it's gonna have the hi-hat, the t -t -t sound. On the hi-hat, just to give you a little hint already, you want the ones that are on the beat to be louder than the ones that are off the beat. So you already have to find- I play, I play drums level 16. Right, okay. I'm very drums. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. So, oh, okay. I've never done it, okay, on, a, then. I've never done it on a MIDI board, Right, okay. Well, now you can now kit. you can have a go. Okay, okay so cool. uh, you know then how to do... You, you should be able to do a basic drum beat then, yeah. Yeah? yeah? So see if you can build a basic straight eight first of all. Okay. So just do cat do cat Yeah. And that's it? Yeah. If you want to, then have a little bit of an explore with, well, what happens when I move the kick drum around? Mm -hmm. Can I go... What happens if I add some snare drums really quietly? I don't know if you got into doing this at grade five, but like ghosting the mm -hmm. snare. Where you have... So there's this little snare drums that are a lot quieter than the rest. Yeah. Exper experimenting with opening the hi hats. Yeah. So, do, t, 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 yeah. pea souping it. P soup, p soup, p soup, p soup, <laughs> like disco. Yeah. Yeah. So, see what the effects are yeah. against what it is that you do. Yeah. So, you could record yourself doing a strumming pattern or a finger style pattern or whatever you want in time with the click, of course. Then have a go at programming some drums to it and see if you can feel where it works and what does work and what doesn't work. Because what you'll almost certainly find is that you will have done accents on the guitar that when you do a straight eight groove, it feels like not quite right. Like you want to move some of the kick drums. That's mm. that when you're working with a real drummer, they're listening to you and adapting and it's all in yeah. real time. Whereas what you probably find or what I find when I'm programming something that I'm writing, I'll write it first. I'll go in and try and program some drums up. 
And what I nearly always find is that in programming the drums up, I find a groove that feels better to play against, but I need to replay it because I was playing it mm. without the influence of the drums. drums. But once I've solidified the drum groove and I'm like, oh, this is the, the groove that feels nice on the drums, yeah. I then want to replay the guitar with the drums to make it feel, to make it fe feel, feel, make it feel good because it's the, the feeling thing is the key. One of the things I noticed with a lot of the songs I listen to is you can never hear what they're doing on the hi-hat, whether it's actually there or not. But okay. it's a lot more kick, snare and toms. And okay. that's where the groove is rather than just like... Okay, then, then, then maybe you don't have the hi-hat. <laughs> you don't have to have it. Yeah. I'm just thinking it's a good... Practice. Before you said that you'd done any drums, it's a good idea to have an understanding of a basic straight eighth. Yeah. Like how it's constructed and what it sounds like. Yeah. And then the idea of like opening some of the hi-hats and closing them. If you've got a program drum, you can literally just grab it and drag it up, usually two notes, mm -hmm. and it'll be an open hi-hat. Usually yeah. it's like an F sharp is the closed hi-hat. Actually, it would be up two tones. So F sharp is the closed hi-hat and A sharp will be the open. It's on the th where the three black keys are together. Okay. If you've got a standard MIDI setup. Yeah. The, the first of the group of three will be the closed hat and the open will be on the other one. So obviously not across the whole keyboard, so you need to experiment with each group of three on your keyboard yeah. to find the one that's the hi-hat. But yeah. Um, yeah, just getting some, some relationship with that is mm -hmm. a really, really good idea. Ideally, what I think, I, what I would like to impose on you as a project for this year will be the ability to record your own songs and create a basic production. Mm -hmm. So learning a little bit about how the drums form, how the bass relates with the drums. I'm not saying that you should become a bass player, yeah. but you should have some understanding of what it's like to be able to create, like the little sketchy thing that we gave, that I gave to, to, <coughs> to David, oh, I can't talk. I gave to, to Dave to create a drums and bass production. The interesting thing there was that uh, when I spoke to him about the groove uh, and what I wanted, I wasn't consulting you. And I said, well, like he said, I think it needs to be a little bit faster to make it sit better. And then when we started talking about, y y we got it back and you were like, well, it sounds too happy now. It's like, yeah, okay. So this is where that production stuff, if you can get your own production, to give people a basic that. feeling of it. And you've thought about like how fast and slow it should be and what sort of feeling it should have. And then learning to describe that to a drummer or a rhythm section or whatever, yeah. that can be a really helpful thing. Yeah. Like as as a songwriter to have that sort of level of proficiency. And frankly, all of the kids can do it now. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you're 17 and you're a songwriter, you're totally hit with Logic and Pro Tools and Ableton yeah. and programming up the shit and what compression is and doing a rough mix and how to master it. I, it freaks me out that kids know so much now. <laughs> but that's become kind of the standard thing. Yeah. Yeah. for young songwriters because the tools are all available now on a bloody computer. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, you had to go into a studio and only the dude in the white jacket knew how to use it all. Yeah. I'm kidding on the white jacket. That was earlier than my time. Thanks for <laughs> saying, oh, you're not that old, Justin. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think that would be a really good skill set yeah, to cool. incorporate as well. Yeah. So you've got your additional practice then is to try and program some drums Play guitar, program some drums to it, and then maybe replay the guitar. But just to explore the programming of the drums. Knowing that you know a bit about drums, you're not allowed to use Kyle anymore. You have to program it. I want you to have a go I at it. I can never find it. one that fits like, with the pre-programmed drums. Even yeah. ex experimenting with all the complex stuff, slouds, it never fits with what I can think yeah. of what I want. So it'd be a lot easier to, to learn how to do it myself. Yes. I mean, I, I must admit, I can do it myself to a certain degree, but I tend to use grooves, um, pre-programmed grooves, just because even if I do it myself, it takes so long to make it sound mm. authentic Yeah. that I just end up getting... Now, I use a thing called Superior Drummer, which if you've got a couple of hundred quid floating around spare and you want to do something for your drums, mm -hmm. it's amazing because it's real grooves played in on MIDI drums by real drummers. Yeah. But you get all of those little nuances that are really difficult to program effectively. Yeah. And, and and they feel good. It's not like it will be if you just program it. It'll yeah. be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, 
that's something to explore as well. Maybe later down the way if you decide that you want to get more into the production cool. thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So moving on through the for the next few lessons, I think we should continue to develop these areas that you feel like are good for you. So more on the strumming and looking at 16th note strumming and how we can vary it and what the different options are with strumming, possibly looking at some more percussive ideas as well. Yeah. Exploring the different types of finger style. Yeah. This week it's going to be working on a groove. Mm -hmm. uh, already thinking next week maybe I should give you a set groove like the one two three one two three one two three one two three one two one two pattern and go take that idea that he's got and apply it to your own song yeah if you get stuck for an idea you could try that this week otherwise i'll give it to you as an exercise next okay. lesson um we'll have the music theory and i want you to report back each lesson now and tell me what lessons you did and how it was helpful okay yep. specifically i want you to stay aware of it yeah okay and then the last one is going to be this recording thing we just talked about cool so that sound like a plan and we'll try and develop each one of those each week each aspect of that but it's important, I want you to be feeding back to me all the time in the lessons, and if, I, if we're hanging out between whatever, to let me know what things are still areas you want to develop. Yeah. Because it is really important that, it's, that we're, I'm giving you the right tools yeah. to build the things you want to build, not me directing it too much. Make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Say goodbye to the internet, Tammy. Bye. Um, we'll see you in a week or two. Bye.